Dear participants, welcome to our webinar. We have been looking forward to this day for quite some time and we are really happy to see that so many have joined us today. My name is Miriam Feilberg. I have been developing this series of webinars with the UNEP DHI partnership, colleagues from DHI and experts from other organizations. I will be facilitating this webinar today. Maya Batula from the UNEP DHI partnership will assist us with running the webinar from the technical side. The purpose is primarily awareness raising on water quality. We will also look into how and why water quality links to sustainable development and how important it is for creating better livelihoods for urban and rural populations. Today we will be introducing the topic and looking into the importance of water quality, in particular linked to sustainable development goals. We will also give an example of how you can work with water quality and we will take a look at European experiences based on the Water Framework Directive as a key policy instrument. So, our program today is first Peter Kofod Bjørnsen, head of UNEP BHI partnership, will look into how water quality is related to global water and development targets. Then, Jan Korsko will give us an inspiring, inspiring example from India. And finally, Jesper Danisø will introduce the EU Water Framework Directive. And please remember, if you have any questions to the presenters, then write them to us in the chat box that you will find in the right side of your laptop on the go to webinar toolbar. Then we will collect the questions and ask the presenters them. But before we proceed, we would like to show a short interview on today's topic. Please meet Joachim Harlen, who is a water resources and development expert. He is working for UNDP, United Nations Development Program. So Joachim, th many thanks for joining us today and uh, we'd like you to say a few words about the SDGs and how they're developing. Perhaps you can start by telling us exactly what are these sustainable development goals and why are they so important? Well, uh, the SDGs, as you say, sustainable development goals, they are the goals that then will replace the millennium development goals that we currently have, which end this year 2015. And uh, the notion of SDGs started off at the Rio Plus 20 summit in 2012. So you could say that this is now the policy framework for the next 15 years as regards development. And together with, um, you could say, means of implementation, financing, and also partnerships and roles and responsibilities of the parties, then we have what we call the post-2015 development agenda. So can I ask you, what's the difference between these Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals? Well, one big difference is that the SDGs, uh, they, they are applicable for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it applies to, so they're universal, global, for, for the North uh, as well as for the South. Uh, another difference is that it, it's, it's very much, they build on, on a quite a large consultative process. So the ownership from the outset is much, much broader, and the agenda itself is so much broader. So we're now seeing a, a framework with 17 goals and, and uh, some 180 or so targets. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to rewind a little, why are they so important? What's, what's, what difference are they going to make to the world compared to what we have today? Uh, the importance uh, is, of course, linked to how member states, um, you could say, commit to them. Mm -hmm. uh, if, we, if we, a policy framework uh, sets an agenda, it, it will help countries to prioritize, but it will also uh, determine a little bit, you know, where, where ODA will flow towards what. Uh, there, was all, there will also be a little bit of follow-up where countries will be compared to each other. So there's incentive here to focus and, and drive towards certain targets uh, and, and certain goals. Um, and we can see uh, with the results of the MDGs that they did make a difference. They made a difference for countries to focus on, on issues and for the global community to support developing countries in this regard. So uh, this series of webinars is all about water quality, water and water quality. Mm. How does water 
feature in the SDGs and how does water quality feature in the SDGs? We are very pleased to see now that among these 17 goals we have a specific, a dedicated water goal, goal number six. And this goal has eight targets. Six of them are, are more technical in nature and two are more related to the means of implementation. And, and it, it's much broader than just water supply and sanitation that we had in the MDGs. Now we have four other targets that are related to more productive uses of water, to water quality, uh, and uh, also to uh, water management, water efficiency, and, and the link between water and ecosystems. So, so we can see the water quality coming in, uh, wastewater treatment, and, and other aspects. So is, uh, is, is perhaps one of the good things about this water goal is that it sets uh, water quality in a more holistic setting whereby issues related to water quality are going to be picked up upon and there will be a set of mutually supporting targets? Definitely, uh, definitely so. Uh, and, and we can see that within the water goal itself, which is very pleasing, and, and we can see that it, it's, it's a much more, you could say, holistic uh, agenda within water itself. But we can also see that, we're, that the other goals also have uh, water quality, you could say, related elements. Where, where water is related to health, water related to ecosystems and so forth. Thank you very much Miriam uh, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, being part of this webinar. Uh, I would like to elaborate a bit on what uh, Joachim Halin, who is the uh, chair of the UN Water Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals, just told us about the post-2015 uh, agenda and uh, go into what, how water quality features in that agenda. Uh, so if we uh, look at the um, MTDs uh, that uh, Joachim talked about that was, were approved in 2000 and with a target date of uh, this year, 2015, uh, water really only featured as specific targets uh, regarding the access to drinking water and the access to proper sanitation facilities. And the target was to half the proportion of people without access to those two basic services. Uh, the drinking water target was was reached at the global level in 2012. But as you can see from the left panel there, there are huge regional differences. And the global achievement was very much due to uh, achievements in, in China in particular and in, in Eastern Asia in general. Uh, whereas in, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's still lacking very much behind. When it comes to the sanitation target, this was the target that uh, performed worst among all the targets of the MTDs. And uh, we still uh, have uh, 2 billion people without proper access to sanitation facilities, 1 billion people uh, who are forced to uh, defecate in the open. Uh, for the lack of other alternatives. Th these uh, drinking water and sanitation uh, targets, of course, have uh, elements of water quality. Uh, access to drinking water doesn't mean anything if the quality is poor, and uh, improper sanitation also has consequences of water uh, quality. But uh, water quality didn't feature uh, explicitly in these, uh, in these targets. So uh, when uh, the um, heads of states met in at the summit in 2012 in Rio, which marked also the 20 years uh, from from the first Rio meeting in '92, they agreed to a much broader agenda on water, uh, realizing that water is uh, fundamental for sustainable development. Um, they also realized that there's unfinished business when it comes to access to uh, safe water and sanitation, that uh, water and sanitation has become acknowledged as a human right, uh, but that there are also other elements that uh, ecosystems have to be taken into consideration, uh, that water-related disasters um, must be considered also, and lastly also specifically addressing uh, water pollution and water quality um, and also to look at the use of the of the resource. So to go a little bit more into detail with some of these points, 
Um, after the summit in Rio, uh, there was a very broad process leading to the definition of a set of sustainable development goals that Joachim Harlin talked about. And it was really a, a very broad process, uh, including formal and informal consultations, uh, informal consultations on the social media, and formal consultations with countries, with regions, and at the global level also, involving several million people actually uh, in, in defining the agenda, leading to the next uh, 15 years of, of uh, development work that would replace the uh, MPDs from 2015. Um, and uh, part of the realization was that there, there is significant unfinished business uh, with water and sanitation, as I mentioned before. Uh, many people without access to water and many people without access to sanitation. And uh, the agreement w was to try and uh, close the gap uh, over the coming 15 years. Uh, there was also a realization that uh, water resources are often inadequately managed at uh, all levels, from the local level to the national level and to the transboundary level also, uh, uh, in view of many water resources being shared among several countries. And uh, then water quality was also brought up uh, by, by many member states that we can't just look at the availability and the quantity of water, we must also include the aspect of water quality. Uh, that needs to be a priority too. And uh, we believe that up to 80% of uh, wastewater is to date discharged to the environment without any treatment. We don't have the actual figure. So this is an estimate, but it's um, quite worrying. Uh, and uh, in fact, some of the achievements with the increased access to water and sanitation has been made at the expense of water quality in the sense that uh, proper treatment of the uh, wastewater has not been ensured. And this, of course, has impact on ecosystems, but also very much on downstream drinking water resources. And finally, the uh, water-related disasters also have become uh, more prominent, uh, probably more frequent also in, in the face of climate change and climate uh, variations. And uh, we have several examples that uh, this has uh, caused major impacts on lives and livelihoods. Uh, and some of these impacts are uh, also through uh, water quality aspects. Uh, this also applies to to uh, industrial disasters with chemical spills. So this was also included in the agenda. Um, water features uh, as a, as a major risk. This is a, a chart that was presented at the uh, World Economic Forum uh, at the beginning of this year, and. Uh, charting the, the, the likelihood of various types of risks and the relative impacts. And you can see that water crises are in the uh, upper right corner. So uh, actually uh, was listed as, as number one global risk. So all this input uh, led to the definition of a dedicated goal for water, as uh, Joachim Harlin mentioned. That's uh, sustainable development goal number six, with the uh, first two targets, 6.1 and 6.2, representing a continuation of the MTG agenda on uh, access to drinking water and sanitation with the, with the new inclusion of hygiene. Uh, and then the four new targets that he was talking about, 6.3, which uh, explicitly mentions improving water quality by reducing pollution uh, and uh, reducing the amount of untreated wastewater and also increasing recycling and safe reuse of uh, wastewater. 6.4 is on the efficient uh, use of the water resource and also keeping uh, water withdrawals within sustainable limits. Um, 6.5 is on the uh, water resource management at all levels including transboundary. 
and 66 is uh, on the protection and restoring water related ecosystems so uh, water quality is uh, as you can see a distinct part of the of the third target but it actually has implications for for all of the targets uh, 6a and 6b are the means of implementation targets that uh, Joachim Halin talked about now uh, you may notice that the water related disasters is not part of this package because this was referred to a different goal and is uh, now part of uh, target 11.5 on uh, together with other other types of uh, disasters so um, this is the uh, this is the um, package of targets as it's now presented in the sustainable development goal number six which will guide the uh, uh, development cooperation and and countries' efforts over the coming 15 years, and uh, these uh, goals and targets are going to be approved by the General Assembly at the end of next week. So I think I will um, stop here, and uh, will be happy to respond to questions. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, we actually have a, a question from one of the participants. Vivek, who has asked us if you can explain what are the top hurdles in meeting these MDG and SDG goals. Thank you. Yeah, there, there, are, there, are, many, uh, there are many hurdles and barriers. And uh, in 2012, uh, we, we did a survey on the status of integrated water resource management and asked countries exactly that question, what are the main barriers? And uh, they had uh, a broad range of, of answers. There's not one one only uh, uh, barrier to this, but it's a it's a mixture of uh, financial constraints, of course, uh, but also uh, capacity constraints in terms of know-how, institutional constraints uh, that the water cuts across so many different sectors that sometimes are uh, not. Uh, working closely together on integrated solutions and uh, and then also uh, policy and political uh, barriers for for uh, for this so it's it's really a a mix of uh, of constraints and uh, i think the uh, the strengths now uh, of of having this dedicated uh, sustainable development goal for water is that it it would be possible to to treat all these different aspects of the water agenda uh, under under one umbrella. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Siad that is really relevant. We'll talk about this in some of the later webinars also, but uh, I think we should still have it right now. So what are the proposed monitoring mechanisms for the SDGs? Right, yes. Yeah. So one, one of the uh, big questions here have been how, uh, how do we make countries uh, accountable for what they're going to uh, approve and endorse next week in uh, in the General Assembly in New York. And uh, for that, uh, all the targets have been required to identify uh, measurable indicators. And for uh, specifically for, for the target 6.3, uh, there are two core indicators proposed. One is on the amount of wastewater that is treated, so the percentage of wastewater that is treated. So that's a very simple figure, uh, which should be the target value of, of 100%, of course. And the other indicator is uh, ambient water quality, and I'm going. I know that we're going to talk a lot more about about that in, throughout the series of, of webinars. Uh, this is much more difficult because there are so many dimensions of water quality. Uh, but the idea is to uh, prioritize some of the mo mo most important of them. For example. Um, um, bacterial uh, pollution or nutrient pollution or dissolved oxygen uh, and uh, to aggregate that into an index of, of uh, water quality or to look at the amount of water bodies that uh, meet certain water quality criteria so but this is uh, this is an indicator that is much more difficult to measure and also admittedly we at this point don't have global data, so this uh, requires the establishment of a monitoring and reporting mechanism. 
Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, with regard to the, the question also on, on ambient water quality, we will be looking more into this even today when we are touching upon the Water Framework Directive. Thank you for the question so far and thank you for the presentation, Peter. We will move on to the next presentation. We will still collect the questions and if we have time when we are finished, then the, um, the presenters will answer some more questions. But thank you so much for sending us the questions. We'll now be looking into some of the European achievements in terms of improving water quality. Yes, that's fine, Miriam. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Jesper Danisö. I'm at, from DHI and I have for many years been working with water quality in different places of the world. But I've also, of course, looked very much into how were things actually changed when we had the European Water Framework Directive. And this presentation will give you an overview of what actually happened in the Water Framework Directive. Now, um, to see, just to show you here, this this is the uh, the map of Europe, and you can see all the blue countries are those that are at present part of the European uh, Union, and those which are then under the Water Framework Directive. But let me give you a short introduction because before we had the the uh, Water Framework Directive, we of course had a lot of water quality uh, ranging stations all over Europe, and with many many different ways of monitoring them, with many different ways of collecting data and with many different ways of reporting the data. So uh, we were also seeing that a lot of countries did only do the monitoring as a sort of an indicative system to see how water quality was moving on. And uh, of course, <clears throat> there were many different focuses, le different levels of protection, and different standards of what a water body is and how you could protect it. Uh, Originally, and what is probably also going on in most countries around the world, is that the chemistry, the water quality, has been the key issue to identify how is the water quality. But what also gradually has happened is that the biological indicators has come more and more forward and has now been more looked upon as a very, very good indicator system also still having the chemistry, but also looking into the biology. But still, before we had the uh, the Water Framework Directive, it was quite difficult to compare compliance between the different countries. And when you have joint policies in EU, you also need to be able to compare across countries. Before the uh, Water Framework, which uh, was uh, uh, adopted in 2000, we had some uh, directives that had the aim of reducing pollution and controlling it. One of them was the nitrate directive from 91, which also tried to protect the waters across Europe to have too much of the nutrients going into the water, which was causing eutrophication and low water quality, most of it coming from untreated wastewater and from farming practice. The other one was the Urban Wastewater Directive from the same year that also tried to set limits to how cities should do something about their wastewater to treat it and to make sure that it didn't have any impacts outside of where it actually came from. This directive was then updated in 98, and one of the reasons why it was updated was that it took quite some time to actually get the real Water Framework Directive going. Now, the Water Framework Directive was under its way for more than seven years, and of course it took a lot of considerations to find out how do we link the national differences together and make something which is comparable across countries. And of course it also aimed at creating a policy which has some consequences. Now most countries have had a lot of monitoring, but the results from the monitoring may not have been used to sort of go back and say, you are not living up to certain criteria and you have to do something. And this was in the Water Framework Directive that the countries had to report back to EU about their progress, about how they were moving towards the goals, and if not, have to explain why they didn't reach the goals. So the idea of the Water Framework Directive was to take an integrated water policy which was well known across the, all the member states, but certainly also looking into how to protect water resources much better. So the Water Framework directi Directive also looks into groundwater. Since the uh, Water Framework Directive was adopted, we have also had a groundwater directive which is a daughter directive of the Water Framework. But it would, and, and you, as you see here from the presentation, that it, it would also work towards having a better link between groundwater and surface water. 
two areas which previously had been sort of dealt with uh, on, on two different ways, and now it, the possibility was there to integrate those two. Now, here are the timings, and I don't want to go through all of them, but you can see here that the that direct directive went into to force in year 2000, and if we look at 2015, this means that in 2015 we would should, in principle, have met most of the environmental objectives. The directive works in six-year period, so the next six-year period will start now in 2015, and it will end in 2021, then the next one will come, and so on and so forth. What are the specific highlights? Well, the biology has moved to the front page, where biology was previously a supportive thing for chemistry, now biology is in the front and chemistry has moved to the second place. This means again that we have also a good link between groundwater and the terrestrial ecosystems because we have the riparian zone, which we have to take into consideration. Many of the animals living close by or at the water edge should be protected and not just if they are in the water. We also have now a much better way of taking wetlands into consideration and to make sure that they are uh, that they are safeguarded. And we also now have a list of mutual a mutual list of priority pollutants, some substances which are highly toxic and which we want to remove from the aquatic system. We now have a joint list that we can all sort of sort of subscribe to and try to work to get out of the water environment. And then also finally some good uh, descriptions and mapping of all the land use in all our catchments that is necessary if you want to do some good planning. All water bodies in Europe are grouped into either rivers or streams to lakes, transitional water and coastal waters. Transitional waters are water bodies that are in between the fresh water and the salt water system. That means typically in the downstream end of big rivers or in uh, enclosed uh, coastal areas like fjords and, and uh, bikes where we have water which is not fresh and is not salt. We divide all our water bodies into, in principle, three major categories. Natural water bodies, that mean water bodies which has not been impacted by human activity or at least only impacted slightly. In Europe, we have a lot of artificial water bodies. That means a lot of reservoirs, a lot of areas where we have stored up water or we, where we have even created new wetlands or lakes. Those we call artificial. And then, finally, we have the heavily modified water body. If you look at the lower picture on uh, the screen now, you will see a canal. This is indeed a heavily modified water body. And the reason for introducing the heavily modified water body is that we will never expect that the animals or the, the biology living in a canal like this one will have the same possibilities as opposed to those living in the natural river that you see on the right side of the, uh, the slide. But that doesn't lift them off from having a good water quality that would potentially make sure that fish and invertebrates and vegetation could thrive in the heavily modified water bodies. Now, if you want to have a big water body, you also need to be able to manage it. And with the Water Framework Directive, we introduced the river basin districts. And these uh, moved, actually, the river basin district authorities from political levels to physical boundaries. So that now means that a water, uh, a river basin district is the whole and natural catchment of a water body. And this also means that if you look across Europe, we are sharing many of the big rivers, for instance, the Rhine, the Danube, the Elbe, and so on and so forth. So this means now that some of the river basin districts, they are cross-national. This is the Rhine. You see it starts in Switzerland. Well, Switzerland is not a member of the EU, but you see it crosses into bordering France and Germany, and it also has some lines into Luxembourg, to Belgium, and to the Netherlands. So this means that the Rhine River Basin Authority is an international authority which takes into account all the different countries which are bordering this river. 
This is of course also an, a challenge to see if you can actually manage across. For the Rhine, fortunately there has been a Rhine Commission for many, many years where they have got used to work together, so it's not that difficult to work like that. Now, what are the responsibilities? Well, of course, they have to identify what we yes, call Yes, well, I'm, I'm sorry just to interrupt you. Yep. Um, can you wrap up in like a minute or so? Well, in that case, uh, I will uh, skip these ones and go on. Yes? Good. Thank because you. the important part is that when you look at all water bodies in Europe, we have decided certain ecological statuses we will accept. We go for high ecological status in untouched water where no human activities have made impact, good ecological status where some human impacts are seen, moderate where more activities are seen, poor when we have really a high impact on human activities and finally the bad ecological status. And the goal is that all water bodies should at the end of the planning period be either high or good ecological status. And that is determined today by biological indicators and also by chemistry which can be used to check whether the water quality is fine. This is just an overview to see how the flow is to see whether we can accept a high status or a bad status. So in order to do that we also have developed some tools and this is one that I will end up by just showing you because you can check it up on the internet and see that this is a very smart way of looking at the different things that are impacting the water quality, the driving forces, the pressures that we see from that, the state and which impacts we have and finally what are the responses we can make. So uh, I would suggest that if you want more on the Water Quality Framework Directive, you, uh, you check simply on the EU website where they have a very substantial uh, collection of plans, uh, presentations and other that will help you in understanding all the different aspects of the water quality or the water framework directive. So I'll end my presentation here with those words. Thank you so much Jesper. We will also in some of the coming webinars look more into detail with, with some of the driving forces, the pressures and, and ways to work also with the water framework directive. We will get back to questions after the next presentation. For now, we will just get back to Jørgen Korsgaard's presentation and turn towards India again. Yes, I will make a presentation on a case story, case story from India, which focus on management of both water quality and uh, and quantity. And. Uh, And just to show where we are, we are in India, we are uh, looking at the river running through Delhi, it's coming from uh, the Himalaya foot and run uh, 1,200 kilometers down to the con confluence with the Ganges River. This river uh, received water from adjacent uh, catchments as well as some from the upstream Ganga River up here. It's run through Delhi, until then it, it's relatively clean and then it get quite polluted. As you will see here, the water is very black in certain spots. There are uh, huge drainage system with no uh, treatment facilities. Uh, but not only the water quality as such is, is bad, there's also a lot of uh, problems with solid waste and garbage coming into this river. And uh, when we have really flow through the system, we can also clearly see something about the condition because in fact the detergents create foaming uh, events on the river as we see on this picture. So there's a huge problem here and, uh, and the, the, it was desired to make a study where uh, we develop a decision support system which both look at how water could be allocated uh, for drinking water, for irrigation, for industrial purposes, but also for some environmental flows within the river. And there we come to the water quality aspects. So in fact the, the management also wants to have a assessment and a tool for evaluating what impact does it have on water quality, what kind of load reduction is necessary, is it po possible to flush the river from some of the barrages that were in, in the system uh, and how, what does it mean that a certain amount of water is allocated for irrigation, respective for 
drinking water for industrial purpose and how much can be left for necessary to be left for the for the river it should be just a little healthy and not very unhygienic so that was the problem and the idea about this project if we look at the elements then as in any other study we of course looked at the existing data and try to analyze the challenge that we see in this some of these was obvious but uh, we need to go a little more into detail uh, to analyze this what was necessary to be done um, for that purpose we designed a monitoring program um, the monitoring program was decided both on the existing data but we set also up a very very preliminary model just to make a mass balance for the system uh, just to see which kind of information we were lacking I will return to that in a few minutes uh, then we use uh, we calibrate such a model and we use it for simulation of some scenarios and all together with this beginning from the start of the study there was uh, designed a decision support system uh, the purpose of that was that decision makers should be able to uh, make new scenarios new analysis without having a detailed expert knowledge and using all these software tools if we look into the analysis that was carried on uh, these graphs show the upper graphs show the red line is the uh, calculated uh, concentration of organic material measured at BUD uh, the green spots is the measure values and we have here the slope of the river shown behind but what we really can see here that is that there are some areas where we can see this big difference between the calculated values and the monitor values and this was indicating that we are lacking information and in this way we use this mass balance uh, and model study to optimize the uh, monitoring program which should collect additional data for, for the study Uh, for this study we use a dynamic model uh, Mike 11 uh, but in most cases uh, this could maybe not be possible but even though it's not possible to put up a very advanced model then a simple mass balance in an Excel sheet or something like that uh, back of envelope calculation is very useful to see whether we see this difference between theoretical values and the measured values in the in the system in this case just to show how complicated this was here's the main river going down from from the Himalaya to the confluence of Ganges there's an infl inflow here from a tributary and another tributary here and you see all the blue uh, inflows that is pollution load or the red uh, is water outtakes and uh, and that's a very complicated system so for this purpose where well, they also want to make some simulation afterwards of scenarios it was very useful to put up a more dynamic model but in more simple cases you can achieve the same uh, result of such an analysis with even much uh, less complicated modeling systems in this case the model includes not only the load coming into the system the flow in the system and the dynamic of that but also the transformation processes within the system uh, here I just illustrate the process regarding degradation organic material the nitrogen transformation the phosphorus transformation and then of course it was also very important we have a bacterial model included taking into account the decay of the bacteria within the system so this entire system was set up and it was calibrated and we made some scenarios with this and as you see here uh, this is a plan view of the river where we can see that the, the color indicates the critical uh, how critical the condition was with respect to, to oxygen we have the red spots here and in the Delhi area and if you look here on the oxygen concentration we have the upstream part here the unit is here milligram per liter we can see it's quite good condition up here then you come to the Delhi area we can see the oxygen concentration really decrease to very low and critical value the black line is the baseline then we have used a model for doing some 
scenarios, which are the blue and the, and the red line, and we see it has some improvement, although it still are critical in some areas. <coughs> so if you look at how what was the outcome of this uh, analysis, then it was concluded that we could achieve something by flushing with water from the reservoir upstream, but it was not sufficient. We could do something uh, with the proposed pollution reductions, but still we also had to take into account that the population was increasing, and we could uh, simulate with this system that uh, even though you have some load reduction and flush the system, it was not sufficient to achieve good water quality. And then the model was used for, for quantifying uh, how much additional reduction we, we, in the pollution was needed to achieve certain uh, water quality goals. Uh, the, this will be my last slide. Uh, is just show part of this decision support system. As I mentioned in the beginning, this was just both a system that was focused on water allocation and on water quality. So in fact, there is a system, uh, a part of the system that are focused more on the uh, water allocation. So decision makers can see if we allocate that much water for irrigation or industrial purpose, how does it then look further down along the system uh, some target was set up for water quality, no, for water quantity requirement, a certain uh, spots, hot spots in the in the area, and then the system uh, could uh, show you easily the decision makers uh, what the consequences of certain plans would be, where they could uh, fulfill these targets. Then the system sent, in fact, information to the river model with the water quality and calculate what the consequence will be respect to water quality if the water was distributed or handled in a certain way. And what the decision makers should give input is highlighted in these gray boxes, uh, some input data on meteorological things and how, uh, how much water is used for different users, and then they should put in some information of population numbers and, and how, what type of treatment they will assume in the system. And then, in fact, without having a lot of detailed knowledge about all these processes and all these systems, they, the idea was that they get a tool or some results out that show where the critical uh, problem will be uh, or how they can solve it. Yes, thank you. That was what I will present for now. Thank you so much, Jan, for sharing your insight and experiences. Um, I just have a question for you from one of our participants who asked if you can clarify what you actually mean by flushing system and what processes this does involve. Yeah, the case is in, in this system there are several, uh, three or four main barrages in the system. And there, in fact, they can store water. And if they uh, store water for critical time period, then the idea was that they could s use some of this water for, for flushing, not using everything, everything for irrigation, but take some of the water out and flush it down through the system and then create a higher dilution for the downstream areas. In fact, there's downstream some of these barriers, there are nearly no water going through the barrage and then in fact, it's nearly 100% shoots you have there. So the idea was to create a better minimum flow in the system and see whether that was sufficient. Thank you so much. I hope, I hope that clarifies this. I also have a question for Jesper, um, but while you are ans answering the question, I would like to ask the participants to answer another poll that we are doing. Um, we are doing these webinars and it's a kind of work in progress, so we would like to have your input on some of the topics. You can write to us in chat messages and um, you can also help us by answering this poll that uh, Maya is running now. So yes, but here's a question for you. Could you clarify ecological status further? Does it uh, look at impact on humans also? 
Well, in fact, it doesn't look at impacts in humans because the whole idea of the Water Framework Directive is to find a way to classify river or water bodies. And the overall idea is that if the water quality is good, then the biology will also be well established in the river. And due to the fact that, uh, in that biological indicators are much more uh, easy to give a long-term perspective of the water quality instead of a sort of very short-lived uh, water quality analysis, then the whole idea is that when water quality is good, then the animal has a good area to live in. But of course, if the water quality is very good, then it also means that people can utilize the water, for instance, for recreative uses, not directly for drinking, because that is not the way we do it in, in Europe, but they can also use it for, for other purposes. Thank you so much. I think we have one more question coming in. Is that also for Jesper? Yes, we have a question from Asma who asks, why not use water quality index instead of these complex variables? I think this is for Jesper, isn't it? Well, if you take a water sample, uh, what you get is actually a snapshot of the situation. What happens between that sample and the sample you may take one month later, you don't know anything about. But the animals that are living in the river, they will be constantly impacted by the water quality. And that means that if there are any incidents between water sample number one and water sample number two, for instance, that there's no oxygen during just 24 hours, then all the animals will die. And we will see that when we take our biological sample and we can see that something happened. So you could say that a water quality analysis traditionally is a snapshot using biology is a constant video of what is going on in the water body. Okay. Um, I would just like to finish up by thanking you again for your participation. We have recorded the webinar. We will send you a link to the recording when this is available. This will be sometime next week probably. And of course we look very much forward to meeting you again. Next webinar will be on September the 30th where we'll look into water quality challenges and issues. And you can look uh, at the link here. We will also send it to you with the presentations uh, for more information. And uh, you're, of course, very welcome to write to us with the questions and suggestions for more input. But for now, I will just, once again, thank you all very much for participation. And uh, we look forward to meeting you again.